Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jeff Schott. I'm with the Institute of Public Affairs at the University of Iowa. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, uh, we are an outreach service of the university. So I am not an academic, I have to point that out. I am actually a former city manager. My wife likes to say I'm a recovering city manager. <laughs> I was a city manager in Marion, uh, outside of Cedar Rapids, for about 20 years. And before that, I was in planning and community development uh, in Marion, Muscatine, a few other places. Uh, I also did economic development. So um, I've been involved with a lot of local government meetings and agencies and groups and lots and lots and lots of different meetings of boards and commissions and city councils and, and that type of thing. And what we're going to be talking about today is uh, training for board and commission members and I know we have a mayor in the audience. Everything we talk about, even though it's kind of focused on boards and commissions, it applies to city councils, boards of supervisors, uh, regional groups of, of various kinds. I do want to point out that I am not an attorney, and I am not giving you any legal advice. I think you're going to hear me say several times today that there are times when you really need to consult your attorney on various issues and items. We'll talk about that and explain it and why it would be important for you to do so. So what we're going to be talking about today is first of all uh, the legal and fiduciary duties as a board or commission member and for those of you who are uh, members of nonprofit boards or organizations the uh, legal fiduciary requirements of nonprofits is spelled out in Iowa law. We'll talk about those. But there are also legal responsibilities as members of city or county or governmental agencies or boards. And we'll talk about what those are. But in addition to doing what is legal, we want to talk about doing what is right as a board or commission member. And then at the end, we'll talk about ways to enhance board effectiveness. So for those of you who are on nonprofit organizations, on boards of directors of nonprofits, there are three requirements spelled out in the Iowa law which require members of nonprofit boards to have a duty of care, a duty of loyalty, and a duty of obedience. So what do those three things mean? Well, let's start with a duty of care. As a, as a board member on a nonprofit board, and I would like to point out that even if you are not on a nonprofit board, if you're on a city or county or other type of governmental board or agency, I think these things still apply. But you are required as a nonprofit, a member of a nonprofit board, to exercise your responsibilities in good faith and with diligence, care, and skill. So what does that mean? Well, number one, you should be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about and make yourselves knowledgeable about the issues and items and decisions that you are making on the board. And that means doing uh, the homework, studying the issues in advance of coming to the meeting. So be knowledgeable about what it is you're being asked uh, to decide about. And things like reading meeting minutes. You know, if you're not able to attend a meeting, to, to apprise yourself of what has been going on and attending meetings. And is doing this in another location, and we're talking about a... a a situation where, and this happened to be a city council member, uh, kind of went away on vacation from about uh, Thanksgiving through Easter. Well, again, that, the, the duty of care doesn't necessarily apply to an elected official, but the idea of somebody missing meetings for three or four months, and of course during those times of the year, that's when the city is reviewing and ultimately adopting budget 
doing labor negotiations, a lot of very important things. So attending meetings becomes important. Participating in discussions, just showing up and not saying anything, not participating. There's an expectation as a board member that you'll actively involve yourself in discussions and participate. And as a board to provide oversight. And we'll talk about oversight in more detail uh, in a few minutes. There is a duty of loyalty to place the interests of the organization above your personal interests. And as a board member on a nonprofit organization, and I will point out as a, a board member or commission member on a local government board or agency or city council or board of supervisors, uh, it is very important to avoid conflict of interest situations and provide full disclosure of a conflict if you have one in advance early on in the process. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And certainly not to take part in any decision not to vote if there is a uh, possible conflict. And then the third duty as a nonprofit is to carry out the mission of the organization and, of course, comply with the laws and governing documents. So, number one, you need to know what is the mission of the particular organization that, uh, on which you are sitting as a board member and then adhere to that mission. Uh, of course, you need to comply with federal, state, laws and regulations. That, of course, applies to those of you on local government boards as well. And as a nonprofit, there are articles of incorporation and bylaws that, number one, you need to make sure you understand, know what they are, and then comply with as well. Now, for local government agencies, there are a number of legal requirements that we want to talk about today. And we'll start with the open meetings law. Then we'll talk about the public records law, the gift law, conflict of interest law, and then a few other laws. There's a lot of different laws, of course, that apply to, to boards and commissions and, and uh, city and county agencies. Uh, but these are ones we'll be concentrating on here uh, this afternoon. So let's start with the open meetings law. It's chapter 21 of the Iowa Code, and it applies to meetings of local government boards, commissions, city councils, boards of supervisors, and advisory committees of those boards and commissions. It applies no matter where the meeting is held. I've, had, I've done this in a lot of locations around the state, and sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, we normally will meet at the library, but we're going to meet someplace else so we don't have to follow the open meetings law. Regardless of where the meeting is held, the, open, the provisions of the open meeting law apply. And it applies whether it is a formal meeting where the board or commission is taking action, making decisions, or sometimes I hear people say, well, it's just a planning meeting. It's just a work session. So the open meetings law doesn't apply. The provisions of the open meetings law apply whether it is a formal meeting or an informal meeting. So the question is, what is a meeting? And a meeting is whenever a quorum is present, and for most boards and commissions and city councils, boards of supervisors, that is a majority of the members plus one. There may be a few organizations where the quorum is defined a little bit differently, but for most groups it is a quorum, a majority plus one, and you are considering official business. So the question sometimes gets raised, you've got a five-member board, and just by coincidence three of you are invited to the same Christmas party. Is that considered a meeting under the open meetings law? Does anybody want to care to guess? Is that a meeting? Depends if they discuss business or not. 
That's a, the, the answer was it depends whether they discuss business or not. That's exactly right. Maybe it's a meeting, maybe it's not a meeting. If you have a majority, a quorum at a, a particular place, and all they do is talk about, we're in Ames now, so I usually talk about Hawkeye football, but we'll talk about Cyclone football, or the weather, or the crops, it's not a meeting. They start talking about business. They're talking about what happened at last week's meeting or next week's meeting. That could be considered a meeting. You have a five-member board, and just so happens three of you are carpooling to Des Moines for a meeting. You better not be talking about official business. Talk about everything but. So quorum is present, and you are discussing business official business, that would be considered a meeting. And under the Iowa law, with a few exceptions, and we'll talk about the exceptions in a minute, meetings are supposed to be open to the public. And the way the Iowa law is written, if there is any question, uh, is this or is this not a, an open meeting, you're supposed to make a dis if you're going to make an error, you err on the side of openness, okay? Meetings must be open to the public. So a citizen of your community or somebody, a non-resident or a newspaper reporter, anybody can know that there is a meeting and attend your meeting. The meetings must be open to the public. Under Iowa law, meetings, as defined uh, as up... Uh, on our screen here, you are required to post notice of that meeting at least 24 hours in advance of that meeting. Okay? The posting has to be the physical written document, usually your agenda. The idea being that Anybody can go to a certain location. You have to identify the location, a designated location, where you are posting your meeting notices. Now, in a community, they don't all have to be at the same place. So the library board can post their meeting notices at the library. The park board can post their meeting notices at the community center. City council can post their meeting notices at the uh, uh, council chambers in City Hall. They don't all have to be the same place, but it has to be at a location that has been announced so that any citizen or non-citizen, if they're interested in your meeting, will know I can go to this particular location at least 24 hours in advance and I can see what is going to be discussed at that meeting. Now take a question in just a second. I do want to point out that that meeting notice should indicate the topics that are going to be discussed at that meeting. So that a person who's interested in that meeting will know we're going to be talking about th uh, these five things at tonight's meeting. Uh, many groups will sometimes have something on the agenda called other business, old business, new business, that really does not give a lot of clarity, specificity to what's going to be discussed at that meeting. The idea is that a person can look at the agenda and know this is what's going to be discussed and maybe decide to attend the meeting or maybe not. Yeah, there's a question. Well, the question is, uh, what about electronic posting on websites in the age that we live in? Um, when you say it has to be said that there's a place for it, is that considered a place or does it have to be a written page? The question is, what about electronic posting of meeting notices and agendas? Those are great, and we certainly encourage them. That does not mean that absolves you for the requirement of posting a written notice. That law was written a long time ago, well before the electronic era. So we certainly encourage groups to post your agendas and post your uh, minutes online 
you still have to post a, a, a written a, a piece of paper on the uh, on the bulletin board or wherever it's been designated. You also need to be careful to make sure that that location for that meeting notice is accessible to the public. Uh, I'm aware of a group that they had their meeting on a Monday evening. They posted the notice well in advance on Friday. The problem is they posted it inside the building, which was locked over the weekend. So the idea was that the citizen could not get access to that agenda. Now, if you put it on an outside window, you're probably going to be okay. So you do have to follow those posting requirements. And the posting requirements have to indicate what you're going to be discussing. Now, sometimes emergencies happen. So we have a council meeting tonight. We posted our meeting notice last night, 24 hours in advance, no problem. This morning, we had a sewer break. And we have got to hire a contractor or buy some supplies not on the agenda. The law does allow for emergency items to be discussed at the meeting. But it needs to be a bona fide emergency. What's an emergency? Here is where I strongly recommend you consult with your attorney. Does your attorney feel that the particular item is enough to be considered an emergency. And I would put it right in the minutes that the attorney was consulted about this particular item and the attorney, attorney's opinion was this is in fact an emergency under the provisions of Iowa law. I've heard of groups that said, well, you know, we put, did the agenda we forgot we got somebody coming in from the other side of the state tonight. We forgot to put it on the agenda. That's an emergency. Again, consult with your attorney. That's probably not an emergency. Um, so once your agenda is set, except for bona fide emergencies, those are the kinds of things you need to you just stick to those items. Now, a lot of groups will have something called citizen presentations or citizen comments where you allow citizens to speak either before or sometimes after the meeting. Uh, that's fine, and I think it's a very good idea, but be careful about making any kinds of decisions other than perhaps referring a particular item that a citizen may, may bring up to a committee or you say, well, we want to talk about it at the next meeting. Because obviously when you're preparing the agenda, you don't know who's going to be coming to speak on a particular citizen item. But just be very, very careful about making any final decisions and getting too much into uh, discussion or details on that particular item other than referring it to a subsequent meeting or referring it to committee. If you have a meeting under Iowa law, you must take minutes. And again, I've heard groups say, well, it was just a planning meeting. We weren't deciding anything. Therefore, we didn't have minutes. No, you still need to have minutes. The minutes need to reflect who was at the meeting. And it does not have to be a verbatim account of everything that is said at that particular meeting. But you say, we had a, uh, a planning meeting to discuss uh, uh, plans for uh, a widening of a, a runway at our airport board or whatever it might be, no decisions were made. But you knew, do need to take minutes of those meetings. Electronic meetings. Two parts to this. Start with the easy part. If a member of your board or commission <laughs> cannot attend a meeting, they are allowed to participate electronically, telephonically, provided you have a speaker phone set up so that not only the person 
participating telephonically can hear what is being said in the, at the meeting, and not only the, the members of the board or commission, but also the members of the audience, they can hear what's going on, and the members of the audience and the other board members can hear what that individual who is not present is saying. You just cannot have a member of your board on the phone with Joe, who's in Florida on vacation, and say, well, Joe votes yes. That's not good enough. But if you have a telephonic, uh, you know, speakerphone system, so they can hear what the, the person who's absent, who was, who's on, uh, away from the meeting, they can hear what's being said, the people in the audience can hear what's being said. That's the easy question. Now, we said a quorum, or a, a meeting is when you have a quorum and you're considering official business. What about electronic communication between board or commission members? One board member sends an email to the rest of the board about something on the agenda or some other item of official business. Do you think that is considered a meeting under Iowa law. Anybody want to guess? Yes. Okay. Comment said yes. Anybody disagree? It's a trick question. The answer is we don't know. <laughs> because the Iowa Supreme Court has not ruled on this issue yet. It has been ruled on by Supreme Courts around, in many states around the country, and some states right around Iowa, and most Supreme Courts have ruled, yes, it is a meeting. So you need to be careful about that. I've been in meetings with city attorneys and county attorneys. They've discussed this. I think the general opinion is it probably would be considered a meeting, especially if in that message a person is advocating action. <coughs> Now, if it's a strictly factual matter, perhaps not. For instance, you're on the Planning and Zoning Commission. There's an item coming up uh, involving a rezoning case, and the question is about uh, the issue of traffic safety. One commission member checks with the police department or whoever keeps track of traffic records, accident records, and they send an email to the rest of the commission I checked with the police department about the accident history with regard to this intersection, and uh, there have been three accidents in the last three years at this intersection. Strictly factual, you're probably going to be okay, but you never know because it hasn't gone to the courts. However, if I checked with the police department, there's only been three accidents in the last three years, therefore, I think this is um, not going to be a problem for this rezoning. Urging action, that is probably going to be considered a problem. I haven't met too many city attorneys who are real anxious to take this up on behalf of, uh, of the board or commission, so you want to be careful about that. Yes? What if uh, I, as a director, want to send information out to the to the to the commission or board. Yeah, the question is what if a staff person wants to send information out to the board or commission? That's not a problem. That's not a violation of the open meetings law, just like I'm sure you send out memos, council or board packets. No problem at all. Likewise, if it's just a communication between two board members, assuming it's not a three-member board, but there's less than a quorum, that's not a problem, just like you talk on the phone or talk at the coffee shop. But if you're involving board members, considering official business, a quorum, that could be considered a problem. Now, the other thing to consider, we'll talk about this a little bit later, whether or not a quorum is present, it's probably that, that uh, communication, whether it's from the staff person or from a board member, it's probably going to be considered a public record. And I have seen <laughs> emails 
from, let's say, council members to other council members, they, you know, so-and-so's got a request in next week's agenda. I've known that person since high school, and he's a lying, no-good scoundrel. Don't believe a word he tells you. You know, may have only gone to one board member. It still could be considered a public record. So be very careful about that. Consult your attorney again, again, again. You get into these, there's a lot of gray areas. And as a, a member of a board or commission, local government board or commission, we'll talk about violations of the open meetings law and public records law in a little bit. If you rely upon the advice of your attorney, you want to say going into closed session or uh, whatever, but you're relying upon their advice and they're wrong, that's going to protect you personally if, in fact, there was a mistake made. So we certainly urge you to consult your attorney. And particularly when we talk about the exceptions to the open meetings rule, executive sessions, closed sessions, there are circumstances when a board or commission or city council or board of supervisors can close their meetings to the public for certain things. They're spelled out under section 21.5 of the Iowa Code. There's other things on the list, but these are the, the main ones that most groups are going to get involved with. Litigation. We either it's present, you've been sued, or it's likely. Now, I know if you're on the city council, you say, well, or the Board of Supervisors, we can get sued about everything or anything. It, it, you, so you just can't go into executive session saying, that there's a chance we might get sued over this. But if you've been threatened with a lawsuit or you have actually been sued, the idea is that you can go into executive session for the purpose of discussing legal strategy with your attorney, and you don't have to worry about what your discussions of your legal strategy being in the newspaper the next day or somebody from the other side being able to hear what that legal strategy might be. So you can go into executive session for that. You can go into executive session to discuss either the purchase or sale of real estate only where the premature disclosure is expected to increase the price. So you need to be talking about a specific parcel of property, not, let's say you're on the park board or the planning and zoning commission, you're doing some long range planning, you say, well, 20 years from now we're going to need some park lane on the north side of town. That's probably not enough. But if you're talking about we need to acquire this piece of prop, these, these five acres located here, you know, you want to discuss, well, we'll offer this, but we might go up to here and... Uh, so those types of discussions can be in executive session. And this last one, this third one, I've seen more mistakes made than anything else. A board or commission can go into executive session or city council or board of supervisors to evaluate the professional competency, competency of someone to be hired or evaluated or terminated only if that individual requests the executive session. That individual has to ask for it. There was a case of a city council, or at least a couple of members of the city council, wanting to fire city manager. And there were some rumors and gossip around town. City manager did not want to go into executive session. He wanted the opportunity to confront those accusations he wanted the public to hear it. He wanted the, the uh, press to be uh, able to hear that. He refused to allow the council to go into executive session, and the city manager was determined to be within his rights. You cannot go into executive session except with the employee's consent. Yeah, the question. The question is, should the individual be informed in advance? 
Um, that's a good question. I don't know if there, it's, I'm not aware of it being a requirement. And certainly you can say because the, no, the, the meetings are posted 24 hours in advance, they would have the opportunity to do so. I certainly think it's a good practice on the part of the board or commission to let the employee know we're going to be going into executive session. Now, it may be a challenge. Let's say you're talking about the, the, um, the board is considering the hiring of an individual. And there may be candidates from all over the country. Uh, first of all, how do you get the, the, the consent of those applicants to go into executive session to consider their uh, application? A lot of uh, uh, local government groups will have on their application forms uh, a section where the, um, the candidate can consent, uh, hereby consent to um, a board or commission going into closed session to consider my application. But if you don't do that, I would suggest contacting that individual, trying to get uh, preferably written consent, if not verbal consent, to go into executive session. And particularly if you're down to like four or five or six uh, finalists. If you go into executive session as a board or commission, several things you need to be aware of. They're not on the slide, by the way. One, you need a, a vote, a positive vote, by uh, two-thirds of the members of your board or commission who are present at the meeting. So if you have a five-member board, they're all present, it's three to two vote to go into executive session, you can't go into executive session. Once you go, well, that, let me back up a minute. You need to announce publicly and put it in the minutes what the reasons for going into executive session are. We're going into executive session for the purpose of discussing uh, a real estate uh, acquisition or litigation. You need to uh, announce this is the reason we're going into executive session and put it in the minutes. And once you go into executive session, stick to that topic. Don't wander off. And yet when we started talking about litigation, and all of a sudden we're talking about something else. And there's a very good reason I'll talk about it in just a minute. Before I do that, not in the legislation, not required. And again, I am not an attorney, so I'm not giving you legal advice. But I would certainly suggest, strongly suggest, that before you go into executive session, you consult with your attorney as to whether or not the subject matter is eligible to go into executive session, give your attorney plenty of advance notice because sometimes these can be close calls. You don't just want to ask them three seconds before the meeting. So they may need to research some things. And announce publicly and put in the minutes we have discussed the subject matter of the uh, proposed executive session with the attorney. Preferably the attorney is at the meeting, but maybe not. But even if he, he or she is not, and now put it in the minutes and announce it publicly, we have discussed the subject matter, and the attorney finds that the subject matter is in compliance with uh, the Iowa Code. Okay? Because, again, as I said before, if you're relying upon the advice of your attorney, even if your attorney is wrong, that's going to provide protection for you in case it's ruled to be an impermissible subject for executive session. Once you go into executive session, you are required, required to tape that meeting, when I say tape, it could be a digital recording, but you've got to have a recording of it, and somebody has to take contemporaneous notes at the meeting. Soon as that meeting is over, my suggestion is 
You take that tape or disc and the contemporaneous notes, put them in a sealed envelope, date it and stamp it or whatever, and then put it in a very secure spot like the vault in the clerk's office or whatever locations you have available to you. Sometimes you have a situation where you have a board member, council member, who was not at that executive session. They're, they're off in Florida. They want uh, they come back next week and they want to listen to that tape. And so they say, well, I'll open the envelope and listen to the tape. Do not, I do not recommend doing that. We'll talk about the violations in a minute. That's going to be, that tape is probably going to be Exhibit A in case you get challenged on it. You want to maintain the uh, chain of custody on that particular uh, envelope and the tape. I don't think there's anything wrong with having two tape recorders going at the same time, but you want to maintain the, the sanctity of that tape. Okay? Any questions about uh, the open meetings law before we move on to public records? Yes? If you go into an executive session, make the recording, and then find out later that you somehow screwed up the posting, and does that then become an open meeting, and is that tape subject to discovery? The question is, if you go into executive session, you've got the tape going, and you find out later you screwed up, and it really was not subject to um, uh, an executive session, shouldn't have been, does that tape become a public record? The answer is, I don't know. Um, Certainly, if you violate the open meetings law, that can invalidate whatever proceedings are being taken on over, you know, um, any of the actions. And I do want to point out, this is an important point, you cannot take final actions in executive session. The final action has to be in open meeting, whether it's the purchase of land or... or um, Hiring or firing of employees, that has to be done in open meeting. Um, I don't know whether, well, let me, if the subject matter of the executive session was probably ineligible for an executive session, I would guess, as a non legal opinion, I would guess it probably would be an open. A, a be considered a public record. But I don't know that for sure. That'd be something to quest, ask your attorney. Other questions about public records or open meetings law before we move to public records? The, the statute says that after the court looks at it and decides it should have been an open meeting, then the court can determine that the minutes are public. Okay, so the comment was according to the statute, that if the court looks at it and decides it was, it should have been an open meeting subject, that probably is going to be uh, available to the public. And as I understand it, um, on real estate transactions, once the action has been taken, then that, that information, the tapes, can be uh, uh, available to the public as well. Uh, the other thing, you know, think about it when say talk, consult your attorney. Uh, that, that's important. It has to be your attorney or the county attorney or the state attorney general. It can't just be any attorney you happen to bump into in the street in, in the afternoon in terms of relying <laughs> upon advice. <laughs> you laugh, but I've seen that happen. <laughs> well, I talked to Joe. He's not our attorney, but he kind of knows what's going on. Well, it has to be your attorney. Yes. And you have to vote to come back. You have to vote yes, to come to, out of the yes. executive session. And then you can take action on something that you talked about in that session. Correct. The point is you have to vote to get out of executive session. And then you're back in open meeting, public meeting, 
and then you take act, vote by voting, take action on whatever the item is. And as I said before, that tape is out there. That tape is available. If you are challenged for violation of the open meetings law, probably the first thing that's going to be asked for is a copy of that tape. And again, I, I, I have to say, I've seen this happen where you go into executive session for the right reasons and then you end up talking about a lot of other things once the door is closed. You've got to be very, very careful about that. The public records law is chapter 22 of the Iowa Code. And all persons, including non-residents, have the right to examine your public records during regular business hours without charge. So we're in Ames, I live in Marion, but I could go to Ames City Hall and ask to see records. They have to let me see them. They don't have to ask, they shouldn't ask, why do you want to see them? Okay? But anybody, does, whether there's a member of the news media or a, uh, a resident of your community, but it could be, they could be from Kalamazoo, Michigan, they still can have the right to examine your records. And records means written documents, you know, so the hard copy paper documents, but also tapes and also electronic media. And I have been told, I, I can't verify this, but I have been told of a situation last year in a community, uh, a relatively small town, but they had a really intense zoning fight. Public hearing, zoning hearing before the city council. The council room was packed, the news media was there. And during the public hearing, the story goes, that a couple of the council members appeared to be texting each other or somehow electronically communicating with each other during the meeting. After the meeting, a reporter from the local paper went up to the council members and said, I'd like to see what it was that you were communicating, texting. And the council member said, well, I'm not going to let you see it. It's my own personal cell phone or iPhone or whatever it was. Uh, you can't have it, I'm not going to show it to you. Well, regardless of whether that device is your own personal property or the city's or it could be your employer's, maybe a communication uh, from work, if it's dealing with city business, that's probably going to be considered a public record. We talked a little while ago about you know, it might just may be a communication between two council members, but you say some nasty things about somebody else, that could be considered a public record. And in this particular case, what was happening, the two council members, apparently, were communicating about the people that were speaking at the public hearing, and they weren't being very friendly about it, very making snide, nasty remarks about it. And eventually the reporter got those communications and, of course, what's on the paper, what's on the front page of the paper the next day. So be very careful. Just we talked about, it may not be a, a meeting per se under the Iowa law. That doesn't mean the communication can't be a public record and a, a, obtainable. So be very careful. And, of course, as you all know, you may, it may be a communication, email, or text just between two people but that second person forwards it on to somebody else, sometimes inadvertently, and it can be a problem. So records under the public records law includes electronic records, electronic documents. We talked about any uh, person has the right to examine, to look at public records. They also have the right to obtain copies for a reasonable cost. Now, what's a reasonable cost? It should be what you're, you typically charge somebody for making a copy uh, under normal circumstances. You can't just add on administrative overhead and personnel costs and all this and that. 
all of a sudden it's $25 a copy. Now you can try to ask the person to get a little bit more specific about what it is they're trying to, to look for. I could, when I was in Marion, a city manager in Marion, we had a person come into City Hall. They started with asked for 10 years worth of financial records. I mean, that's a lot of records. And, you know, we probably would have had to provide it with just, you know, can you narrow it down a little bit? And eventually you got it down to like within a three month period in a particular year. They were looking for one thing. But you've got to be careful. Don't just ask, why do you want it for or anything like that? But we just want to kind of narrow it down so we can produce the records. And you need to be able to produce the records at a reasonable, in a reasonable time. Now, obviously, if they want 10 years worth of records, that's going to take a lot longer to produce than I want to see some information from last week's meeting. So you need to, to, to kind of watch that. There are confidential records, records that you are not required to produce uh, as a local government. There are certain personnel records that are confidential, but there are also certain personnel records that are public records. Names of your employees, their, their titles, their, their salary, their pay history, dates of employment, dates of termination if they no longer work there, those are public records. You do not have to give out addresses, phone numbers, you certainly should not be giving out social security numbers or health records. Okay? Last year, the legislature actually clarified an issue that was a bit of a concern to some people as to you know, work uh, materials, draft, you're, you're working on something. Can somebody just walk in and say, I want to see a copy of that? It was really unclear in the law. They clarified that a tentative preliminary draft or research materials prior to final completion are considered confidential records. They do not have to be released. So I'm working on the budget for my agency. It has not been presented yet to the, the board or the council. It's still a work document that you do not have a, a requirement to provide that information, make that available. Once it is in final form, it's been presented to the board or perhaps presented to a finance committee, then you're probably going to have to, to consider that a public record. And there's uh, all sorts of law enforcement information, of course, that's considered uh, confidential. So the police department's doing a criminal investigation into me. I can't walk into the police department and say, I want to see the file on me. That's uh, obvious. And the law enforcement, police, and sheriff, they know what's involved there. Um, if you're in, on the library board, there's all sorts of laws and regulations with regard to library records. But again, your library director should be aware of what those are. Again, consult your attorney. Uh, some of these things can be pretty difficult. Sometimes the open records law uh, or the public records law clashes with other laws, whether it's be the HIPAA laws or other laws. So consult your attorney, especially you get into the summer season. You may have temporary employees or folks working on the front desk who don't normally work there and may not be familiar with the rules. There's no requirement that says you have to give that information to them immediately. You certainly have the right to consult with somebody to make sure that the information they're asking for is uh, considered a public record. Okay, the question was asked earlier. You screwed up. You have violated the open meetings law or the public records law. What happens? Members of the board or commission, not staff, the members who participate in a violation are subject to a $100 to $500 fine unless 2011 
legislature intensified that law if a member knowingly participates in a violation the fine goes up a thousand to twenty five hundred dollars the problem is the, the law does not define what knowingly means but I would suggest that if you have consulted with your attorney like I hope you do and your attorney says you cannot go into executive session on that particular item and you do anyway and I've heard of cases where that's happened that's probably a knowing violation so those fines can get pretty stiff and the fines may not be paid by the local government the individual member has to pay the fine and again as we said particularly with the uh, the open meetings law if there's a uh, allegation that you have violated the open meetings law went to executive session for something that you shouldn't have that tape uh, and those those notes are probably going to be the first thing people ask for ask to see so again consult your attorney if you, again you relied upon the advice of your attorney you're probably going to be okay if you voted no you was a, you're one of the people that you had to take a vote to go into executive session you voted no you're probably going to be okay I will point out that there is a new board it was created a couple of years ago it doesn't take full effect until July 1 of this year uh, which now has authority to investigate allegations of violations of the open meetings law and the public records law before if there's an allegation uh, a person would either have to go to the county attorney's office or file their own suit or go to the state uh, ombudsman but the ombudsman really has no authority in terms of penalties now there's a new uh, advisory board public communication advisory board they have the authority to investigate complaints they have the authority to subpoena records and they have the authority to impose penalties and fines so there's a little more teeth in these laws than there was a, a few years ago before we move on to the gift law any questions about open meetings or public records now the gift law is chapter 68 B of the code of Iowa which says that local officials and here's one those of you who are DOT employees this applies to you applies to me as a University of Iowa employee whether you are a, a staff person employee or a board or commission member or elected official you may not accept any gift of more than three dollars per calendar day from restricted donors now as I was researching this I actually felt pretty good because I always thought it was I couldn't accept a gift of three dollars it's more than three dollars so I can't accept a gift of three dollars from a restricted donor 301 you can't okay. so the question is what's a in a calendar day so what is a restricted donor those who seek to do business with your agency so if you're on the airport board and you're looking at buying a new mower a vendor who sells mowers would be considered somebody seeking to do business they'd be a restricted donor if you're on the city council or board of supervisors that's a lot of people trying to do business with your particular agency I would suspect those engaged in activities regulated or controlled by your agency would be considered restricted donors and those who could be directly and substantially financially affected greater than the public's interest 
by the donee's performance or non-performance, which would be, say, you're on the Planning and Zoning Commission, the zoning, you're, you're updating the zoning map or the zoning ordinance. Now, obviously, that affects every person in town, but a, a developer or somebody who owns large tracts of land is probably going to be more substantially financially affected by that zoning map or zoning ordinance. They are restricted donors. There are some exceptions. You can accept campaign contributions if you're running for political office. Okay. You can accept informational materials, books and catalogs, reports. So if you're on the airport board, the vendor for selling uh, that mower can provide you with catalog or written material with regard to their product. You can receive gifts from your relatives. I'm on the Planning and Zoning Commission. My brother-in-law is the largest developer in town. My brother-in-law can buy me a Cadillac Escalade for my birthday or for Christmas. Uh, I think that's going to be okay. It doesn't look very good, and there's always the perception. <laughs> but no fear, because my brother-in-law, <clears throat> not the largest, but I'm not on the Planning Commission either. <laughs> but... The other thing is that the law does specify exactly what those, who those relatives are. Take a look at that law. It's not, you know, fourth cousin 15 times removed. It lists, you know, the parents and grandparents and grandchildren and aunts and uncles. But you can receive gifts from relatives. <clears throat> Anything distributed to the general public. So the co-op or the bank is handing out caps or t-shirts or whatever as part of a promotion or open house, you can accept those gifts as long as it's available to others in your community. You can accept food or lodging or travel for speaking. So you get invited to speak to the Rotary Club or Kiwanis at noon and they, they provide you a lunch, which is probably going to be more than $3. That's okay if it's part of a speaking engagement. And items as part of conferences. So you go to a conference, whether it's the Iowa League of Cities or Association of Counties or other groups. They may have vendors out there and they're giving away uh, uh, different things. That could be part. That, that's not a problem. Otherwise, you cannot receive items of value of more than $3 from restricted donors per calendar day. So I don't know how much a cup of coffee costs here in Ames, but if a cup of coffee costs a dollar fifty, a restricted donor could buy me a cup of coffee in the morning and a cup of coffee in the afternoon. But if it's a dollar fifty-five, no dice, just one cup of coffee. And that law hasn't changed for years and years, and it's not likely to either. There's a conflict of interest law. Under the Iowa Code, I tried to summarize it in a way that makes sense, and I just couldn't do it, so I just quoted the law. Um, the idea being that if, I, as a member of a board or commission or a city council, if you have a financial interest in a particular item, particular matter, you are not to be participating in that. There are some provisions, depending on the size of a community, where you may have uh, providing services, and depending on the size of the community, it may be up to $2,500 in uh, a year's time, a fiscal year's time, or in some cases $1,500. So you might want to check that. The idea, though, is that you should not have a financial interest in the interest uh, uh, items of under consideration. The law does allow certain exceptions if you are providing the service on the basis of competitive bidding, a contract awarded through competitive bidding, you're okay. If you have ownership less than 5%, so maybe you work for a bank and your agency or board is considering a you know, financial uh, banking relationship, if you have less than 5% ownership in that bank, you're okay. Um, that's not a conflict of interest. Five, more than 5%, it would be considered a conflict. 
or if he had a contract with a, the agency and it was uh, entered into before you were appointed or elected to that board or commission, you're okay, but you cannot renew it. Otherwise, just like we talked about with the nonprofit boards, if you have a conflict of interest, first of all, you should publicly disclose it. And I, my recommendation is it should be disclosed at the very beginning before you really start, before there's any even discussion or consideration of it. The item may be announced on the agenda, say, I am not taking part in consideration of this because I have a conflict of interest. You publicly announce it, and by no means should you take any action, particularly in terms of voting with respect to that particular item. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the human resources. Uh, a lot of the boards and groups that we're dealing with here don't have a lot of uh, uh, employees. I do want to give a few comments to talk about if, in fact, your organization has employees, it's important for you to understand the chain of command in your organization, particularly if you have a director. The director is going to be responsible, in most cases, for the employees under the director's supervision, not board members having the authority to give directions or, or uh, uh, indicate to employees what they should or shouldn't do. So understand what the chain of command is in your organization and follow it. Make sure your agency has up-to-date current personnel policies, job descriptions. Have your attorneys review those on a, on a periodic, regular basis. I got called into a community not too long ago. They're having some really significant personnel issues. And they're about to ready to take some actions. And they said, well, what do your personnel policies say? And they couldn't find their personnel policy. They didn't know where they were. They eventually located them in the clerk's office. They had to dust them off. The personnel policies were from the 70s. They had not been updated since the 1970s. And the last thing you want to do is take, start changing, revising, updating your personnel policies right before you take some kind of severe personnel action. So keep those things current. As a board member, you just need to make sure those personnel policies and job descriptions are current. And there's just all sorts of important laws dealing with human resources. We don't need to go into those at, uh, now. But obviously, if your agency or organization has a collective bargaining agreement under Iowa law, with Chapter 20, that, that, that governs collective bargaining, you need to understand what, what, how that law affects you and your organization. And there's all sorts of other laws that apply, whether it's in terms of veterans' uh, benefits, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, if your community is governed under civil service, what those might be, civil rights, or, uh, civil rights laws, it's just a, a host of things. Again, the board and commission don't need to be, um, have a full understanding, they just need to understand there are laws, you just can't go out and do some things without first making sure they're proper. So that's the legal stuff in a nutshell, very cool, brief nutshell. Well, in addition to doing what, is, uh, doing what is legal, complying with legal requirements, as board and commission members, hopefully, you all behave with integrity and, and uh, you, you behave ethically. But in addition to those, which are, of course, very important, what are you doing? What, what is the role of the board? Why are you there? And what I'd like to suggest is, as a board member, commission member, you should be setting policies. What are the governing policies for your agency, for your organization? And some of them may be established by state or federal laws local codes, state codes, whatever. But in addition, what are the governing policies for your board or commission? 
And then, I talked about oversight a little earlier at the beginning, making sure those policies are followed and periodically reviewing them. Identifying the goals and objectives of your organization. What is it that, as an organization, as a board, what is it you're trying to accomplish? What are your goals? Short range, you know, in the next year to two years. And longer range, three to five years or longer. What are the results? And really, really important financial oversight. And I've got to tell you, I've been in a lot of communities around the state of Iowa here recently, cities and counties both, and there are a number of communities that are in really desperate financial shape. And the problem is their governing agent, the city councils, board of supervisors, did not know about it until way, way too late. Though as a board member, if you have financial authority, you know, sometimes I say, well, that's the city council or that's the board of supervisors. But if you have responsibility for the the finances of your organization. Make sure, number one, yet your financial policies are being followed. And sometimes people say, well, we don't have financial policies. Well, maybe you should have financial policies. You know, you say, as, a, as an example, a lot of agencies I've heard in, in city, uh, our general fund has been depleted or other type funds. Well, do we have a policy in terms of what kind of balance, cash balance, do we uh, want to keep in these particular funds? You know, establish a policy and make sure they're being done, make sure they're being followed. If you have budgetary authority, of course, you review and approve the budget. You know, cities and counties are required to adopt budgets by March 15th of the year, so a lot of you have just completed that. But that doesn't mean your responsibilities are over. On a regular basis, you should be monitoring revenues and expenditures to make sure you sometimes say, well, geez, you kind of monitor the expenditure side, but revenues aren't coming in the way we're expected to, and you could have budgetary problems that way. Financial planning, you've got a big project you're planning, maybe several years out. It's like a big capital project. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to generate the funds to make that happen? Even if you're going after grants, state or federal grants, where do you come up with the local match? And this next uh, item here, uh, the audit division of DOT really wanted to make sure, emphasize this, you get audits, hopefully, on a, on a regular basis. Make sure you review, as a board and commission member and staff, review those audit findings if you get them and ensure that they are followed up, that they are addressed, that the issues and concerns that are pointed out in the audit are taken seriously. So what the auditors are really emphasizing, if you get comments regarding segregation of in incompatible duties and you know, in small agencies, it's hard not to get something. Like they only have one or two people in the office. It's hard to segregate duties. But follow up on those audit recommendations. Try to separate duties dealing with uh, money. So the preparing checks and signing checks and reconciling uh, bank statements. Keep those as separate as possible. And if you've got very small offices, at the very least, Make sure you get dual signatures on checks. You're just not relying upon one person. And make sure they have others reviewing your bank reconciliation and expenditure reports. Make sure that the person who is approving pay increases is not the person who is getting the pay increase. <laughs> And we laugh, but that has happened. Somebody else should be reviewing those. And if you get into a situation where you're dealing with what they call less than arm's length transactions, whether somebody on the board or somebody on staff, 
you're dealing with, uh, say, renting space, renting office space, or, or purchasing or leasing equipment, whatever, make sure that there is oversight by others, particularly the board, to make sure that appropriate care is taken so that you don't have a, a, a situation of conflict of interest. So be very, very careful about that. You should have policies in place. The board should be approving all the bills and expenditures, including contracts, and of course contracts. And as an agency, you should establish policies governing your purchasing and procurement. And if you are receiving state or federal money, there, are, there may be state and federal rules and requirements that you're going to have to comply with. And I don't want to get involved in this because this is really complicated, but if you are involved in a public in construction of public improvements, streets and sewers and bridges and whatever, there's all sorts of state and federal, especially state rules and requirements in terms of public bidding, depending on the engineer's estimate of the cost of that particular improvement over a certain dollar amount depending on the population of a community there may be a formalized bidding process which includes notices public hearings uh, there's other procedures if it's less than that amount again as a board or commission you just need to know that there's rules in place your staff your attorney your consulting engineer should be up to speed on this. You just need to make sure you understand that there's laws in place. You just can't go out and say, do it. You've got to go through a process. The last thing I want to talk about are just some strategies to improve board effectiveness. What can you do to improve your processes, your organizational structure? What can you do to improve your performance as a board there are six things we want to talk about briefly, kind of in reverse order of importance. Talking about working towards board improvement, exercising appropriate authority, communicating, enhancing teamwork, improving decision making, and lastly, or actually the most important of all, acting strategically. So let's just look at these uh, very quickly. The first item, board improvement. <coughs> The whole idea is as a board, a commission, elected officials, you're responsible for the operations of your organization, you're responsible probably for a lot of money. So take advantage of opportunities such as our session here today, but other items, whether it's through your regional planning commission or council of governments, through state agencies, state associations, Iowa League of Cities, Association of Counties, whatever you have, take advantage of those opportunities to learn more about what is happening in the areas that you're dealing with, understand what the new rules are and requirements, what issues are coming down the pike. Take advantage of those. I strongly suggest developing processes for orienting new board members. I know I've had this happen to me personally get appointed to a board or commission, sometimes it was a governmental board, sometimes it's a nonprofit board. They just put you on the board and say, okay, now you're on this board. The board members need to understand why are they there. So give them an orientation. What is the mission of your board or agency or organization? Make sure they have copies of the bylaw, history. And talk about those legal requirements. If it's a local government board, Make sure they understand the open meetings law, public records law, gift law. There may be, again, local codes that apply, city codes, county codes, state codes. Make sure they understand. They happen to be on a board with substantial authority, like the Zoning Board of Adjustment, Civil Service Commission, Human Rights Commission. There's a lot of uh, rules and requirements that they have to comply with. Make sure the board members understand what are the key programs and activities of your board or organization. 
What are your recent accomplishments? What have you been doing recently? And a big one, make sure they understand these are ongoing projects. We started them. You maybe haven't seen them yet. They're on, in the planning stage. We've been budgeted for. But these are things the board's probably going to be dealing with in the next uh, several months or a year. So these are these ongoing projects, ongoing commitments. And if the board has done any type of goal setting, prioritizing, what are the board's priorities, short term, long term? Make sure they understand these are the duties of the board members. What are the organizational structure of your board? Do you have committees? And especially if they've been appointed to a committee, whether it's a personnel committee, finance committee, whatever it is. Understand this is how the, the, the structure works in your particular agency. And the staffing. And what is the authority? Again, we talked about the chain of command. We have, this is the director, and underneath the director are these uh, positions. So they understand your organization. And any other key documents or the budget. If, for instance, if you're on the airport board, you probably have an airport layout plan. So whatever those documents might be, make sure they have an understanding of what those are. Number five on the list is exercising appropriate authority. This is kind of a follow-up about that board orientation, about understanding the roles and responsibilities of the board and of staff. So again, the, the role of the board may vary a little bit from agency to agency, organization to organization. But at a, a minimum, I would suggest that the board should be very involved in defining and determining the strategy and planning of the agency. You know, what is your mission and your values? What are the issues that are going to be impacting you? And then setting those policies, setting those plans, and then making sure you comply with those. Making decisions on your direction and resources, whether it's the annual budget, that's going to determine what are the things you're going to be doing in the next year, but just on a meeting-to-meeting -meeting basis, you're making decisions, approving bills, approving contracts, those types of things. You should be involved in communication. We'll have that as a separate strategy. The board should be setting the tone for the organization. If the board has authority over the hiring or firing or evaluation of the director, that's a very, very important role. And they should take that seriously, Start, especially in evaluation. Really think through, how are you going to do that? Don't just wait for the day before the meeting when they're going to be evaluating the director. Think, now, what are, we, what are we going to use to evaluate the director? Think through the process. What instruments, evaluation instruments, are you going to be using? And as we mentioned before, if your board has f oversight over the finances of your organization, making sure that they, you're actually... Uh, providing that financial oversight. Making sure as a board member that the programs and services and activities and operations of your board are being provided. Are you getting the results that you want? And if not, what adjustments can, you be, can be made to try to achieve those results, or maybe you just terminate those results. Now, I know in most areas of the state, this is a big problem. I know in the Ames area, money's not a problem. <laughs> but assuming you have scarce resources, how are you using those resources? And when I say scarce resource, of course it's money, but there's other resources, staffing and time of staff of the board. So if you have scarce resources, are you using those resources the most efficient and effective way? Now some activities, programs, operations, you are required maybe to provide. Others are optional, discretionary. So what are you, how are you using your resources? On the staff side, what I'd like to suggest, make sure staff, hopefully, are the experts. They should be analyzing the issues for the board. That doesn't mean the board is a rubber stamp, but they should be 
providing that insight and evaluation of the various issues that are presented to you, identifying alternatives for you to consider as a board member. I personally believe the staff should be providing professional recommendations so that the board can consider that. And then once the board has decided, made decisions with regard to policies and programs and resources, it should be up to staff to develop implementation plans and programs and those systems that are needed to make things happen. The, the staff should set the tone for the internal organization, educate and develop the employees, evaluate and adjust performance of staff, and kind of, the staff should be responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. The number four strategy for board effectiveness is communication. I work with a lot of different groups, local, state, uh, city groups of various types. Every group that I work with, the issue of communication comes out. There's, whether it's between the uh, board or the council and the public, or between the board and the, the staff, how can we improve communications? So there's, a, I think, a very, very important role for board, particularly if you are an agency dealing with multiple jurisdictions, multiple stakeholders. As a board, I think it's really critical to develop and maintain communication links to whoever it is you're dealing with, whether it's other governments, stakeholders, community members. It's really important to educate your community, if you're on the, the airport board, why is that local airport important for your community? And sometimes it's important to try to advocate for a particular cause or project or issue and mobilize support for it. It's really important, number three, to try to develop and foster teamwork and by teamwork, I do not mean that every vote has to be unanimous. You can have split votes, three to two votes, four to three votes, and still have good teamwork. But what I mean by teamwork is functioning cohesively as a group within your board or commission, between the board and staff, and also between the board and others in the, if you're in a local government situation, whether with the city council or co county board of supervisors. And the idea being that all of you are trying to work together to achieve common objectives. So you have to decide what are our objectives. And that's why he says number one on the priority list, what are the things you're trying to accomplish? And because you have limited resources, it's important to try to build collaborations, build partnerships with other governmental groups, with other community groups, nonprofits, for profits, statewide organizations. It's really important to, to leverage as many of these resources as possible. As board members, some suggestions for trying to Improve teamwork. One of the things that found, uh, one of the things that's most frustrating to good teamwork, and I know none of you would have this situation personally, ever been to a board meeting and the person next to you, you see they're opening up the packet for the first time at that meeting. That's pretty frustrating, isn't it? That's pretty frustrating to teamwork. And they're usually one of all the questions, too. So, to build teamwork, it's important to participate with commitment, which means do your homework. Study the materials in advance of the meeting. We talked about that under the, some of the requirements of, for nonprofits to put in the time necessary. Make sure to share information among all board members, those of you who are on staff. This can be very, very frustrating to board members. Well, person over here has got more information than I do on this particular item. With electronic communications these days, emails, it's a lot easier to share information. Got to be careful about the open, the public meetings business. 
but if you're just sharing factual information so that everybody on the board has the same amount of information. And develop and use various processes to handle common issues and what the issues are will probably vary from board to board but some things that I'd like to suggest agenda development. You're on the board or commission. How do things get on the agenda and if you've got something you want on the agenda how does that get on? And just in the last week I've been involved in some things in communities and you know there's been some real frustration or certain members that I, I not, the thing that I want just never ends up on the agenda. Well, who is responsible for developing your agenda? And if a board member wants something on the agenda, do you have a process for doing that? Or does it take a majority of the board members to get on the agenda? But you should have a process in place. Make sure that there's an understanding of the information that gets to the board and when the information that gets in the meeting packets. And that can be a challenge. It could be a challenge to staff. I know as in Marion, we had two council members. One council member was retired military, career military. He wanted everything short and sweet, if not more than two paragraphs, succinct. Another council member was electrical engineer. He wanted to see all of the background information. And the calc, you know, if it was an engineering, anything, SOAR project, he wanted to see the calculations from the consulting engineer or whatever. Well, it's impossible to meet the expectations of both of them, but you should be able to have a discussion. You can't have, you've got seven board members, you can't have seven different packets, but you should be able to say, this is what we're going to do and have a discussion with them as to that information and maybe some of that other background information could be available to the board member to, to be able to access that. But sometimes board members can be very frustrated and unhappy because we're not getting the information that we need to make an informed decision. And if you have staff, make sure there's good understanding amongst the board members about how to make requests and directions to staff. And typically the rule is that individual board members have no authority on their own. The board as a whole has a lot of authority. But again, that needs to be discussed amongst your group. And we talked about the need for financial oversight, making sure the board is getting the financial reports that they need to provide that oversight. And sometimes they say, well, geez, I, I can't make heads or tails of these financial reports. And you may be hamstrung by your financial software but an option would be maybe to provide some training to the board. Say, well, we can't fool around with it. You know, the software is kind of the way it is, but this is how you read it, this is how you understand it, and maybe they have a better understanding of how that works. But sometimes it's just the board says, well, we're getting reports quarterly, financial reports, we want to see them monthly or whatever it might be. And if you've established goals and policies, making sure that you follow up with the board, make sure they have a good understanding of the status of implementation of those goals. And again, we talked about that performance reviews of your staff. The number two item in terms of improving performance, effectiveness, decision making. How do you as a board, how do you make those tough decisions that come before you? Well, what we'd like to suggest is at the very start with discuss access and use relevant information. So the question is, okay, well, what's relevant mean? Well, it's going to depend on the matter before you, the issue. But what I'd like to suggest as a board, if you know you've got a tough, big issue coming up, have that discussion early on with staff as to what information you as a board are going to need to properly consider that particular item. Is it operational information, engineering, legal, financial, whatever it might be, so that the staff can do the research to get the information to you. Or if you don't have staff, you're a uh, consultant or wherever you get your information from. And you're probably going to get information from multiple sources, you certainly staff, but you're probably going to get it from the membership of your agency or board or or your stakeholders. 
as staff, try to be as factual and objective as possible, provide that relevant information. So, you know, you've heard what the board has said, what information they're going to have. You provide that, give them alternative recommendations, including, and especially, the do-nothing alternative. Sometimes for boards, that can be the easiest. It sometimes can be the worst alternative. But they have to understand, if we do nothing, this is what's going to happen. Or sometimes it's, well, we've got a state or federal mandate, and do nothing is not on the table. We've got to do something. And then staff can help facilitate the decision process. We like to suggest using what we call deliberate discussions. Not deliberate in the sense of slow, but deliberate in the sense of jury, how a jury deliberates. So you consider the information, the evidence, the information, evaluate it, weigh the pros and cons, consider the different alternatives, and then hopefully make an informed decision. Try to get agreement, again, early on, on the way decisions are going to be made, the process. Are you going to have public information meetings, or public hearings, or neighborhood meetings? What you don't want to do is wait to the very end and somebody say, oh, we should have had a public hearing, or we should have gone out to the neighborhood, or they, we should have got done. You know, think about that in advance. Everybody agree, yeah, this is the process we're going to use. This is the information we're going to need. So at the end, you still may have some disagreement, still may be a split vote, but at least you can say, well, we followed the process that we all agreed upon. Try to consider the, all the information. Frame the issues, so make sure you're all you're focusing on what the issues are. Give yourself adequate time to make decisions. Don't feel like you're rushed. And sometimes you do have these requirements, deadlines, whether from state or federal agencies. But if you have the opportunity, give yourself enough time to make decisions. Again, you don't want to delay for, just for the sake of delay. But sometimes you say, we just need more time to, to collect the, and analyze the information that we're going to need then consider the alternative actions and then make a decision. Then lastly, most importantly, acting strategically. In my opinion, the most important thing. These are tough times. You know, you have limited resources. You're really going to require strategy and planning and resourcefulness. Really think through what is your mission today. Sometimes some groups say, well, that's been our mission for the last 25 years, but does it make sense today? What are your core focus areas? What are your organizational values, those core principles, core values that are so important to your organization? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be as an organization? What do you want to accomplish? What is your vision? And is your vision shared with others, whether it's other groups that you're dealing with or other elected officials, make sure that it's shared. Make sure you have a good understanding. What are the issues that are affecting your organization? You know, whether it's um, cutbacks in state or federal funding or requirements that you're going to have to comply with or you got more money coming in than you know what to do with, which I think... <laughs> what, are, what are the issues that are affecting your organization. And then determine your goals. And the goal, you, you can't do everything. You can only do a certain number of things. And the goals do need to be consistent with one another. I was working with one city council not too long ago. For the first hour and a half of the meeting, all they said was, we got to lower taxes, lower taxes, lower taxes. We've got the, low, the highest taxes in the county. We're at a real disadvantage, economic development, housing, business development, etc. We gotta lower taxes. And we start talking about priorities. So our top priority is we gotta hire more police. Well, I don't know how you hire police and lower taxes. They're both valid goals, but you gotta make some decisions. And that's where priorities come in. And before you talk about what your new goals are, your new priorities, you really need to identify what are your ongoing commitments. These are things that are in the works, and they're probably going to take some money and certainly some time. 
And then what new items, new initiatives do you want to take on? You want to make sure that you identify your goals or smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And then, very, very important, once you've identified your goals or priorities, you've got to talk about implementation, particularly smaller organizations, who's going to do the work? Because sometimes these boards and commissions have grandiose plans and very, very limited staff. How are these things going to get done? Or where is the money going to come from to do these things? So develop an action plan for accomplishing them. Monitor the status so it keeps it in front of the board on a regular basis and periodically review and update as needed. Just to wrap up, some things to ask yourselves, questions to ask yourselves as board members. Do you have a clear understanding of your mission, vision, and values? Do you have priorities? And do you understand them? Does everybody in your organization, your board members, your employees, or groups that you deal with, do they understand your priorities? Do you have a good understanding of your programs and activities and services that are offered by your organization? Are you achieving the results that you want? Are your programs and services and activities aligned with your mission, your core values, your priorities? Do you have regular planning sessions? Do you sit down once a year or every two years and just think about what are the things we want to get done? What are our priorities? Do you try to build those community partnerships we talked about? Are there parts of the job, the board's job, you just don't understand or others on the board don't understand? And if there are, develop a program so that those parts are made clearer, so they have a good understanding. Do you understand your financial condition and how your money, your organization's money, is spent? If your board has authority over the hiring and firing and valuation of your director, do you do that on a periodic, systematic basis? And lastly, as a board, do you ask questions? <laughs>